purple mountain's majesty, amber waves of grain, sea to shining sea. This is America. Cities looted and burned, hatred and racism and bigotry, children massacred in their schools. This is also America. Obviously, crime is a problem in our country. And here in Hickory, it may not be as big of a concern as it is in my city, Memphis. But you know what? I bet it's still something you think about. Maybe you think about it when you're in another city. Or maybe you think about it when your children are away from you or when you're home late at night alone. And what do we think about those people who commit those crimes? Don't we say things like, oh, they're dangerous. Lock them up and throw away the key. They don't, if they get out, they're just going to go back. And you know what? There's some validity to some of those thoughts. Because recidivism is the likelihood that someone who is in prison will get out, commit another crime, and go back. And in our country, recidivism is at 50%. That's half. So what if I were to tell you that we could fight recidivism and crime through education? Now, I want you to hold that thought. I myself used to have some of those same negative perceptions of the incarcerated. But then something happened that changed my mind. I teach college. One of the classes that I teach is public speaking, the class everybody hates. And we're going to call my typical student Jennifer. Now, I love my Jennifers, love them. You might know a Jennifer, you might be raising a Jennifer. But conversations with Jennifer kind of go like this. Jennifer, um, please get off your phone. Dr. G, it's my mom. Jennifer, you're late to class again. Dr. G, I'm tired. Jennifer, where's your assignment? That was due today? So in a room, a classroom full of Jennifers, Stephen stood out. Stephen came in the first day of class and came across and he sat the third row back, far right side of the room. Conversations with Stephen were different. Stephen, That was a great question. Well, Dr. G, I just want to make sure I understand the material. Stephen, I appreciate the fact that you never miss class, but you don't look like you feel well. Why don't you go home? No, Dr. G, I want to be here. Stephen, your work this semester was exceptional. Well, Dr. G, I was in prison, and I don't want to go back. I was stunned. I had a former felon in my class all semester. And immediately, those perceptions that I had about the incarcerated began to be shattered. And they were replaced with images of Stephen and his hard work. A few years later, I got a call from Ashland University. Ashland offers the opportunity for the incarcerated to earn a bachelor's degree in communication. They wanted me to teach a class, and I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. And in conversations with others, things were said like, well, that sounds dangerous. And you're going to interact with the worst of the worst in our society, like every day? And I wasn't sure what to do. But then I remembered Stephen, and I agreed to do it. And this began my journey into the world of prison education. And let me tell you something, these students are different. They are so excited about taking classes, and they want to learn. And their emails with me are heartwarming and heartbreaking. Dr. G, thank you for just listening. Dr. G, thank you for taking the time to educate the the voiceless and the desolate and the powerless. You see, they know what recidivism is. 
and they don't want to be a statistic. Speaking of statistics, that 50% recidivism rate that I told you about when I began, if someone takes vocational classes while they're incarcerated, that 50% drops to 30%. If they have an opportunity to earn an associate's degree while they're incarcerated, it drops to 14%. If someone earns a bachelor's degree while incarcerated, recidivism goes down to a little more than five and a half percent. And if they earn a master's degree while incarcerated, recidivism is zero. I mean, that's some compelling evidence of the power of education. Last semester, my own college, Arkansas State University Mid-South, asked me to teach a class as a part of a series of vocational classes that we were offering to the incarcerated. I didn't even hesitate. I was thrilled to do it. So I met with my students the first day, and I said, what can I do? What, what do you want to work on? And one of the students said, you know, we're all going to be going up for parole pretty soon, and it's really stressful. Can you help us? And I said, oh, I've got this. I am going to research parole questions. I'm going to research the answers. We are going to workshop. We are going to practice, and I'm going to have you all ready for parole. And the room got quiet, and she said, no, ma'am, we can't do that. Because if we go in front of the parole board and we look like we have rehearsed, we will not get parole. I was, I was stumped. I, that was my answer. I didn't have any more answers. I didn't know what to do. I was frustrated. And I started thinking about them and their world. And, 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 and what they live with it just came like kind of crashing down on me. I thought these people are in a place where violence and, and tension are the norm and they just want to get out and they just want to go home. And in that particular class, about half of my students were repeat offenders. And I said to myself, why? Why, if you have worked so hard to get out of prison and you know what a horrible place it is, why would you make a decision to do something that where you go back? And you know, many of those people who are in prison, they are guilty and they got the sentence that they deserved. Many couldn't afford a good attorney. Many got a longer sentence than they deserved. Many are innocent. And you know what? We send them back into the world, out of prison. They take that prison culture and they bring it with them into our world. And they come out and half, most of the time they're, they go back into poverty. They have no no education, no job skills, no financial support, and no emotional and social support. They commit crime in order to survive. And it's a vicious cycle. And so I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about my students. And I said to myself, you know what? You still got to help them. So let's get creative. And so I started remembering my nephew owns a business in Memphis called Symmetry, and he teaches breath work. He taught me something called box breathing, where you breathe in for four, you hold it for four, you breathe out for four, and you hold it for four. I also remembered a TED Talk by a Dr. Amy Cuddy. And Dr. Cuddy and her, research, her fellow colleagues and researchers at Harvard and Columbia, they did a series of studies. And they proved that if you will put your body in what they call a power pose for one minute before a stressful situation, your body will naturally decrease the cortisol and increase the testosterone. So you feel more powerful. And power poses are things like this. This is the Wonder Woman can do this. If you're sitting waiting for a job interview and you're sitting in a chair, you can kind of splay your arms out or put your arms out, splay your legs out, kind of like the obnoxious person on the airplane. And it works. They have research to prove it. So I went back to class and we did, we did box breathing and we watched the TED Talk and we did power poses. The next time we met, one of the students could not even get in her chair fast enough. And she said, Dr. G, you're not going to believe this. She goes, a fight just about broke out the other night. 
And she just said, I made everybody stop and box breathe. <laughs> Calm down. She was so excited. I was excited. But better yet, two of the women who had been in my class went up for, for parole. They did box breathing. They did the power poses and they got parole. <laughs> made my day. Um, here's the thing, y'all. Prison education has been proven to reduce discipline problems in the facilities. The reason for this is because education in and of itself breaks down racial and ethnic barriers. Y'all, I see this every single day in my own classrooms. So you may say, okay, I'm with you. This prison education thing, great idea. But are they going to be able to get jobs when they get out? Well, you know what? It's a problem. The formerly incarcerated have a harder time finding jobs, especially black men and black women. But the ACLU recently did a study that showed that more and more employers are willing to hire the formerly incarcerated because they are proving to be more loyal employees and have less turnover. So in conclusion, what if recidivism were no longer a problem in our country? What if we could replace that culture of prison with the culture of education? What if we could replace the powerlessness of the incarcerated with the power of education? Let's give the, the in incarcerated the power to earn back their voices. We can do this one class at a time. Thank you.